Welcome. I'm Sean Talajewski, and I will be speaking to you today about the power of automation in manufacturing design. Today, we're going to do a little bit of introduction of myself. We're going to talk about automation types, languages that we often use for these automations. We're going to talk a little bit about what Forge is, and then we're going to look at some manufacturing case studies for uh, projects that Imaginet has completed in the past. And then finally, we're going to bring it all together with a really cool real world example of what automation is starting to look like in today's market. So again, my name is Sean Talajewski. My role with Imaginet is business development manager within our software development solutions group. I joined Imaginet in April of 2006. And in my role, what I do is I help clients, hopefully like you, understand where you're going, what tools you have available to you, and address some of the challenges that you're facing on a daily basis with automated solutions that go beyond the box. These solutions can be CAD-based, they can be standalone, they can be web-based, they can simply be integrations between different systems. And then once we have a project in play and we're working toward a solution, I often stay engaged and act as a liaison between the customer and our technical delivery team. Prior to joining Imaginet, I spent 12 years in the playground industry, from everything from entry-level design staff right out of school <clears throat> into process improvement. That's really where I started doing CAD automations back in the early 90s. Moved my way up into IT management and then off into ERP integrations and other things of that nature before joining Imaginet. So let's focus on a little bit on what types of automation services we're going to be talking about and maybe some that, that Imaginet has done for you in the past or will do hopefully in the future. These can be broken down into larger buckets. I often refer to as task oriented tasks, you know, things that uh, I often say make AutoCAD draw two lines instead of one. That really can be extended into really all of the modern platforms, but you're taking a current design task that you do on a routine basis that maybe takes a little bit of extra time, a lot of constraints and things of that nature and inventor is a perfect example of tasks. And that's some of the ones that we're going to talk about. We also do workflow automations, reacting to events. For example, having vault upon release of a document or, or life cycle change in a document, perform other actions, grab bills of material, push that out into ERP systems, uh, pull together all the documentation and generate PDF packages that can be distributed to outside vendors or uh, installation contractors, whoever it may be. We do a lot of different <clears throat> triggers in different applications to perform these types of things. I refer to those as workflow automations. And then the big one that a lot of people have talked about for many, many years, we, we all heard a lot about it in the early 2000s and really it's, it's a mainstay today, is configuration solutions. Those configuration solutions can be broken down into what's referred to as ETO and CTO configured to order. Uh, you know, you think about your, your early day Dell websites and things of that nature where you go in and you, you make a bunch of choices and pick your computer and you arrive at a solution. That can be applied to just about anything. Then moving into ETO is a little bit more advanced. You know, in those cases, what we're doing is we're designing a solution as, say, for example, a conveyor system is a, is a popular one that, that we see a lot. Uh, as the conveyor gets higher or the packages that uh, are on that that belt get heavier, uh, you need a, a bigger belt or you need uh, stronger I-beams to support it, that sort of thing. You're engineering the solution as you go. Uh, so you're making the parts dynamically. Great example of a, a, of a CTO solution is a playground. That's where I started my career. Uh, it's still my first love in a lot of ways. But building a playground, snapping together components to make a design is a perfect example of a configured to order type solution as well. <clears throat> Once that configuration has been built, what we see is those material, quotes, job packages, all being delivered from that solution. Uh, can also be design documentation for production. Really what you've done is you've captured the intent of a given project, you've consolidated it all, and then you can go to other systems with it. And that brings us to integrations. Those other systems, such as an ERP system or a CRM, if you're talking about upfront sales for quoting and that sort of thing, you're able to grab that data from that configuration and push it into those systems, eliminating all of that extra work and those, those steps that it would have taken for somebody to take that design, 
and then manually type that data in. Also creating the parts. There's a lot of overhead that goes with that. Those type integrations is something that Imagine it does on a daily basis that really drives value from automation services. And then a new area that's really seen a lot of traction get gained in the last three or four years is Autodesk softwares as a service offerings. Often you'll hear that referred to as Forge, and I'll talk about what Forge is here in just a moment. But really all of the big players out there have started to offer APIs to allow you to use their cloud-based products. And Imagine it is, is on the front lines of working with those tools, partnering with other software vendors to be able to provide value through grabbing that data out of our configuration solutions or our uh, workflow automations, tasks, whatever it may have been that we did on the CAD side and drive that into their cloud solutions to be able to use that data downstream. So the toolbox, <clears throat> what do we do to, to build these things? How do we make them? What, what software languages do we work with? So first and foremost, you know, the one that everybody around my generation uh, anyway started with is Lisp. If you were in AutoCAD, you were using Lisp 25 years ago. It's really a, a, a scripting language that allows for the stringing together of multiple commands to be able to get to a solution that did exactly what I described earlier, converted two clicks into one. I can now click uh, that Lisp routine. It can run through, grab the conditions in my drawing, and string those standard commands together to make a solution. Now, Lisp is on, it's on its way out. It's been around for a really long time. It's served a lot of uh, great functions over the years, but it is very cryptic. Uh, it is very proprietary to AutoCAD, and, and really that's where you're, you're stuck when you're working with Lisp is, is inside of AutoCAD. Debugging and all that kind of crazy stuff that, that you get into with Lisp is just so much harder with that older technology. So what we started to see in probably 2000, 2001, something like that, uh, was the introduction of Visual Basic for Applications. I can remember when 14, AutoCAD 1401 came out and it offered Visual Basic for Applications, I started going through and rebuilding all of my Lisp routines in VBA. Uh, why I did that is it had so much better um, form control and you could build more dynamic applications than you could through Lisp and frankly the debugging and, and tra tracking down your errors was so much easier because you had a development environment right there inside of AutoCAD. You could also speak to uh, Excel and Word, other off Word Office documents, that sort of thing that Microsoft was offering had VBA accesses. And you could, you could pull in some other controls and things like that. It really made VBA a powerful solution <clears throat> back in that, that early 2000 timeframe. Again, because of other advancements, it's looking to go away. Uh, there, there's talk, been talk for many years of, of uh, Visual Basic not being offered in AutoCAD anymore, not being offered in main Microsoft products anymore. It was a transitional period there for several years where you had to go through a lot of additional hoops to stand up and maintain your Visual Basic applications as you carried them forward. Uh, really, the, the primary development environment in today's world for uh, Autodesk-based products is .NET. That's been true for probably 15 years now, but it's becoming more and more, you just can't go anywhere else, at least not back toward Lisp or Visual Basic anyway. Uh, there's certainly more things uh, coming out, more things maturing as, the, as we progress through the evolution of the product cycle, but .NET is really the foundation. Autodesk does a great job of offering a full array of development tools, access to all, really all of the commands. There, there's a few small nooks and crannies of functionality that you can't get to, but for all, all purposes, you can do just about anything with .NET. And more importantly, you can do just about anything outside of your CAD platform when you're leveraging .NET. You can connect to the web, you can connect to enterprise resources, you can connect to and control other applications, and you can do all of that in a robust development environment where you can fully debug your solutions as you go, you can work through the nuances of standing up an application. Now recently, 
uh, when I say recently, probably five or six, eight years, something of that nature, you've seen iLogic on the manufacturing side. And this, this presentation is mostly focused in the, in the uh, manufacturing space. So I'm going to speak primarily to iLogic. There's some other things out there, Dynamo and such, that are very similar. But iLogic is kind of the VBA slash Lisp of the inventor world in today's uh, environment. And what I mean by that, it is resident inside the application. You know, you're working directly inside of Inventor. You've got access to a lot of native Inventor features and functionalities. You can drive off of reactions to things much more smoothly as I update a parameter. I can call an iLogic function. It's really a maturing tool set that allows the desktop engineer uh, to be able to automate their tasks, much like we did with Lisp many, many years ago in AutoCAD. Some of the downsides of that is, is, you know, we can start to do too much from the desktop perspective. We see that we're not doing holistic solutions in many cases when we're dealing with iLogic. We're, we're thinking about it from the perspective of, okay, if I were doing this manually, this is what I would do. This is how I would implement my logic to do this. This, this parameter references that parameter. This suppresses that, that sort of thing. Uh, can often lead to a, a very time-consuming process when we're working with a solution solely based on that. So a hybrid of an iLogic solution, I like to use it for uh, part logic, you know, controlling what that part does, maybe some small assemblies, uh, but call that and manage that from an overall .NET solution really turns into a powerful partnership and leverages uh, both systems extremely well. iLogic for maintaining local um, control, it's easy to update, easy to deploy, and then .NET for controlling all of that and making it more enterprise friendly. And then as I mentioned, with the, with the growing market of softwares as a service, we see Forge. And Forge is its own little animal wrapped around Autodesk's offering. And, and many people don't really know what Forge is. They hear the term, you see a lot of the marketing videos, it's all over YouTube these days. But what is, what is Forge really? Forge is a suite of back-end cloud services that allows Autodesk to stand up their software as a service offering. It's really the foundation that they build all of their tools in the cloud on. And they've done an amazing job of extending that to us as a developer community. And when I say us, I'm talking about me in there doing it every day and you as the consumer you're able to take things so much further with Forge than you would have without it. So Autodesk, really kudos on, on doing a great job there. But the, the software services that we're talking about, primarily for most users, is going to be data management, you know, cloud storage, uh, different buckets of information in different places that we can reference really quickly from some of the other solutions. BIM 360 Docs is built on that data management platform. Uh, that's one of the main ones that, that a lot of people know on the manufacturing side. Obviously, we've got Fusion products as well that are all taking advantage of that back-end data management solution. It's really where it all starts. <clears throat> and then for the um, design side, is really what I like to call it, is design automation. Design automation is a subset of Forge services that really, the easiest way to think about it is Inventor in the cloud, AutoCAD in the cloud, Revit in the cloud, Sybil, uh, 3D Studio Max, where you can access those modeling engines and those design platforms in the cloud. And you can interact with them without having to have a seat of those solutions installed on the machine, doing it in a desktop or distributed on, on a network even. You can take advantage of <clears throat> those processing engines in the cloud on powerful Autodesk infrastructure. And when I say powerful, these, these machines are robust. Uh, the, the platform does a great job of uh, failure recovery and queuing and all the things that you have to include when you're managing some sort of a central processing solution. They do all of that for you. And best of all, it's really, really cheap. As it stands right now, it is hard to argue with the forge cost model it is a consumption model so you're paying as you go so you have to think about your processing time i mentioned a moment ago uh, being careful with iLogic and how uh, long it takes to process some of those models if you don't think about it from a holistic perspective 
that really comes into play when you start working with design automation because you're paying for the cycle times on that, that machine that's processing. So you want to be very efficient. Now, don't be afraid of it because it's it's very, very cheap. Uh, 10 minutes for a dollar or something like that. We, we can get into the equation some other time, but uh, really it's it's cycle time that you're, you're paying for there. And it is very, very affordable. What it also is beyond those cloud services, you know, those, those kind of tangible offerings from Autodesk, it's also a robust suite of APIs. I mentioned that Autodesk built all of their online offerings around Forge. Really, it's it stood up and exposed with the programming interface, an API, uh, through Forge. If you've got a subscription-based product, say, for example, M360, Autodesk Construction Cloud, uh, any of the Fusion products, Fusion Manage, any of that, you can access that data and work with it through the Forge API. Hypothetical, if I needed to uh, offer a, a directory list and, and make it look like it's local on my workstation, but it's really housed in BIM 360 docs, I can have an application running that queries docs through the docs API in Forge, gets a list of all the files and structures that's out there and presents it right next to all the other drives that you have available in Windows Explorer. You can make it look like and really mimic the behavior of a, a typical drive resource that we're all so familiar with. That's just one example of working with that data. I can also query it, I can grab all the information out of it, uh, put it into a Power BI reports or Tableau or any of those other processing and, and reporting uh, solutions that are out there and leverage that data. Start to drive that into a digital dashboard. In fact, it's one of the first things that we did with the Forge API the client wanted to have an executive dashboard that shows information to their executive leadership of what's going on in their BIM 360 environment. We would reach out to all the different BIM 360 modules at the time, pull that data in, and pull it back to a centralized dashboard that was easy to consume quickly. You know, I could quickly look and see what's going on, see the health of, of projects as they're moving through uh, my enterprise and see that data and then drive into it. If I wanted to look at a, a detailed record, I could double click it and it would take me directly into my BIM 360 account, pull up that issue or whatever it may have been that I was working from and I can see that data right there. Then another powerful piece of Forge, it's really probably the marquee thing that everybody sees and that everybody um, is so wild and crazy about right now is the Forge viewer being able to take a model and view it inside of a browser. That is, uh, I cannot say just how powerful that is in today's marketplace. Uh, we, that's one of the struggles. As a guy that's been on the front lines for many, many years, that has been a huge struggle. How to get CAD and CAD data into a browser. You know, we converted to PDFs and converted to all sorts of different uh, formats, uh, WebGL, all that kind of stuff we've used in the past to try to visualize these models. Autodesk did us a huge favor when they came up with Forge Viewer. Many have referred to it or heard it uh, called early days as the large format viewer. What it does is it works with the Forge model processing engine known as model derivative APIs to be able to take an inventor model, Revit model, really 70 plus and growing formats and convert that to a file that can be viewed in a browser. And that browsing, as you'll see here in, in a few moments, is really nice. The graphics, the quality there, the tools that you can do work with, turn layers on and off, turn objects on and off, click things, interrogate those objects. It's, it's very much like a true CAD experience, but it's in a browser. Now, when I say a CAD experience, I'm talking about looking at, spinning around, working with the inquiry of particular components. You're not going to necessarily edit, although you can. It's built on uh, 3JS. It's a full modeling engine. You can work with, turn things on and off, swap out components. We're working on solutions right now with clients where we can edit in that Forge Viewer, in that browser directly. We're not necessarily going back to uh, design automation and model derivative in all cases. Now, if I'm parametrically changing, you know, making my widget grow in size, shape, 
then okay, yes, I'm going to I'm going to drive that back to design automation and make those changes. I'm going to roll it back through the model derivative API all very very quickly. You're talking dynamic parametric changes in in seconds and minutes at the most. Uh, but if I'm doing things like uh, swapping out one component, I talked earlier about uh, my uh, career starting in the playground world. If you think about a playground that you might see at a McDonald's or even out in, in a field at a park and recreation type location, you've got a bunch of different components. Let's say I've got a deck that's got a slide on it. And that slide is a spiral slide. And it, that, that puts my budget a little bit too high. So now I want to swap that out for maybe a straight slide that's a little bit more um, cost friendly. So I can make edits like that in real time, dynamically in the browser with robust viewing. It's, 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 it's really changing the market and changing what we can do and how CAD gets delivered to the web. So Autodesk, as I said, did a great job with Forge. And we're going to look at an example of a, of a powerful Forge solution here in, in a few moments. Some of the other things that we need to consider when we're thinking about automation and when we're thinking about rolling out a new solution, we need to think about what our deployment's going to look like. Who's going to be using these tools and where? Uh, we all know how crazy the world has been in the last year or so and, and how we've gone really from uh, the vast majority of us going into an office and sitting in a cubicle or sitting in our office all day in front of CAD and working through it to remote. You know, we're in our home offices, we're working in even traveling hotels and things of that nature as we're starting to open back up some, but we're working remotely. And there's a lot of challenges that come with that. You know, the things that we kind of take for granted of having infrastructure, of having your content and your security and all that kind of stuff is a consideration when you start working with remote assets. Not only do I have to get in necessarily to the VPN, and you know, get access like I'm there, but I can also work through a browser, work through an internet connection. Uh, I need to be able to properly secure my digital data, protect my intellectual property, and think about the downloads because you know we, a lot of you guys have uh, crazy fast internet connections. I'm coming to you today from uh, I think my top end is about 10 megs per second, so it's it's not very quick. Um, when we start talking about large CAD models or, or even uh, even flattened down CAD models, there's still a consideration there when we're sending that data back and forth. So we have to think about who's going to be using it, where they're going to be using it, how they're going to gain access to it. Then we also need to think about updates. So we've made our initial deployment. We've got it out there. We've got our people working with it on a daily basis and, and it's doing a great job. It's, it's seeing all the benefits that we're going to talk about here in a moment. Now we've rolled out a new product. What does that update look like? How do we pass new content? Is it just configuration changes that may control rules of how components go together? Or is it a completely new product line? We've got to think about how to get that content out there and what that update cycle looks like. As we move to more web-based solutions, a lot of that becomes less and less of a problem because now we're deploying to our website. We're not deploying to dozens, hundreds, maybe even thousands of laptops and desktops located all around the world that's going to come in and download gigs of data to get our proper models and things like that. I'm, again, come back to playgrounds quite often. We're working with a client right now that uh, has to deploy on a quarterly basis very, very large CAD updates for AutoCAD blocks and 3D Studio Max models and things of that nature. As you move to the web, you can get rid of that stuff, but until you get there, you've got to think about it. You've got to plan for how am I going to get that data out to my user base. Now, we, we talked about some of the tools that we've used, the languages that we're working with, and some of the other considerations that, that really have to be thought about and planned to properly roll out an enterprise-wide uh, automation. What are some of the benefits? Really, when you start talking about benefits, obviously, First thing that comes to mind is ROI, and the very first thing that comes to mind with ROI is it takes me 25 minutes to do this manually. I can now do it in three seconds when I click the button. So I've taken my script, I've taken my um, new command that I've, I've automated, and it takes away that time. Uh, it, it makes me more efficient as the designer. Okay, that's the easy part of return on investment calculation. You can monitor it, you can measure it, 
you can project what it's going to be in the new world and then you can quantify that as well uh, by after you rolled it out you measure how long it truly takes you and now you know okay i've got this kind of savings but that's not all it's not just taking that time out you're also reusing data so you're able to be more consistent in the information that you're delivering if i'm generating documentation that goes out to uh, shop floor i'm using the same exact content every single time so my annotations are the same my um, dimensions are in the same place so my guys know where to find that information they're not guessing they're not having to interpret the drawing anymore because it's not based on how the CAD user that that made the drawing or made the model did it we're able to drive consistency in that data and, and consistency in the consumption of that data we eliminate mistakes in doing so we increase capacity and we're able to focus on more complex products and solutions that maybe uh, we need to be spending that kind of time on that right now we can't do it because we're flipping ones and zeros to get uh, our annotations to line up and our dimensions to be right all those design related tasks not all go away but we can eliminate the vast majority of them so that's a huge roi component obviously we know that we also can talk about integrations eliminating re-entry if i've generated a model in inventor that model's got a bill of material i can put in phantom components for things that i may not have been modeling but i can have a complete bill of material and i can grab that data out of inventor and i can push it into my erp system so now instead of uh, me doing the design and tossing it over the wall to the uh, cubicle next to me and they re-enter all that data into an ERP system for a, a order entry or um, bomb structure components of their ERP system, I can transfer all that data. And I can do it in a managed way. Let's say I've got Inventor stood up for that bill of material we were just talking about. I check that into Vault. I go through some Vault workflows to go through my approval process. I change it to release. And now I can have that event capture that activity and trigger it all downstream to move that data over and manage that process for me. <clears throat> and that has tremendous business impacts. And those impacts are increased sales. My design throughput goes up. Now I'm not the bottleneck. I'm not out doing manual tasks of, of drawing my model and placing my annotations and all that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm able to let the system do that. I can trust it and I can run through it. So I reduce that cycle time and I reduce the number of cycles. I'm not coming back with red lines and things like that anymore. I can, as I mentioned before, I'm focusing on more complex products. All of that results in being able to, to get more sales through, either because I do want them faster or because I'm able to touch more than I was before. So I increase sales but I also lower the cost of the sales that I have. So if it took me a week in my design and engineering department in the past, it doesn't have to be there that long anymore. I can automate those manual tasks. I can drive that data in and it can be out in minutes, sometimes hours to lower the cost of those sales. And those mistakes that we talked about a moment ago, interpreting designs, missed elements, all of that stuff can be minimized. So now I have production errors. When I'm on a line, best case scenario in a production error, the guy on the shop floor sees it, he knows it's wrong, and he can call it out, stop the process, go back up, and have you fix it, and then do it properly. Second time through, the real world case, he goes ahead and cuts it anyway. Now we've got the wrong product going out the door. Those are, are huge errors that we can avoid through automating those tasks. Now, whew, we've talked about all of the uh, overhead stuff, and we've talked about what we're thinking about, languages you're using. Let's look at some cool examples of real world projects that Imagine has done. I'm going to walk you through a few here. So tank design. What this client, particular client did was they created tanks and pressure vessels that offered a lot of configurability, a lot of different options, things of that nature that all went into building out their design. It created intensive modeling, constraints all over the place, inserting and placing components, all sorts of craziness that you see in, on a daily basis that we've all done in Inventor. What we came up with was a guided solution that walked the designer through that process, entering several parameters and then driving the results into the model. Tools that we used, and simple inventor parametric modeling and a .NET add-in. So what did that look like? So we created 
an advanced form that walked the user through entering all the parameters about their given tank. You know, they selected all the, the layers of the tank, the heights of each one, the, the thickness of the materials. That drove ultimately into a model being generated. So now I'm able to create that tank from a form without ever having to touch the inventor model. We did this many, many years ago. It's a great example of pure task automation, what that might look like today. Let's say I stand up that same form in a web browser and I put a little bit more intelligence around it so I can guide the user that maybe doesn't know all the answers to selecting what they commonly need and push that up into design automation we talked about before. Now they've got a model created for them instantly from a browser that my resources never had to touch. So taking that same solution, moving it forward just a little bit more, taking it out of the CAD platform into a browser really speaks to modern digital transformation that, that we're all here trying to learn about over the, these two days. So that, that may have been done many, many years ago, but it certainly relates to what we're doing today with a little bit of additional effort. Another example, configuration-driven workflow automation. What in the world does that mean? In this particular case, power components. This particular client created point of connection, point of use, power distribution components, basically being able to cut the power off to my large industrial equipment. This was a process of looking at a bill of material coming out of an order from their ERP system, interpreting that bill of material, manually laying out the appropriate case, dropping in sketches, using those sketches as cut profiles, to be able to cut out the locations for the different components that go into it. What did we create? We created a solution that will monitor a given location for these configuration files coming out of this particular client's ERP system. As mentioned, these configuration files contain a bill of material data that tells us what we need for a given design. We take these files, we read through them, we interpret exactly what case we need, we determine what components are going to go into the case. We take sketches from those components that represent the cuts that will be used for the sheet metal design. We project those cuts into the case, obviously cutting out the resulting profiles, giving us a finished assembly that represents the cuts that are going to be needed, the components that are going to be placed, where they're going to be located, and we generate the documentation of that, giving us complete bills of material, complete uh, drawings, both from a annotation and assembly perspective, uh, dimensioning, just a complete drawing package from these cut files that are these uh, configuration files that are included from their original configurator in this bill of material. Really powerful solution here. So let's look at another example. This time, Kind of in the in the uh, vein of what we're doing in this event, we're looking at multi-platform content generation. Autodesk has done a great job of allowing you to go from Inventor to Revit, Revit to Inventor, even AutoCAD, um, as best as possible so far. They've given us tools to be able to take our Inventor models out and bring them into Revit and use them as content. However, this content doesn't always have all of the behaviors that we need. In this example of custom residential doors, this particular client had all of the models that they would possibly need for manufacturing purposes, but didn't have the associated Revit content of the same doors. And they wanted to be able to use that inventor information to generate Revit data. Bringing that over just through BIM export, or I'm sorry, BIM exchange, it's pretty standard, but it loses the behavior. It brings the BIM content, it brings the metadata, but it doesn't behave like a door. This particular client wanted to allow an architect to come into their website, go through their configurator, make all their selections that they need, then behind the scenes, leverage those selections, the XML files that are generated, to create real content that behaved like doors. So what does that mean, behave like a door? Well, a door lives inside of a wall. It has hinge side and swing side, so you can control the location of the, the hinge, the direction it swings, whether it's into the room, out of the room, that sort of thing. So what we did is we created a solution that would read that configuration file, and it would generate that content for them. 
we used iLogic on the inventor side, and we used a .NET add-in to kind of control everything on the Revit side. So what does this look like? Architect using uh, Revit, using standard content, you know, they're going to drop it in, they're going to be able to use standard content there, they'll be able to get their schedule, and as you can see from this schedule example, it's pretty basic information. It certainly communicates that it's an interior door, it's wood, that sort of thing, but it's not appropriate for the real product that's going to be used. So what we wanted to do is allow the architect to come to the existing configurator that this client had, enter all their information, make their selections, you know, their styles, their material, their finishes, all that kind of cool stuff, and then leverage those selections to generate true behavior-specific doors that can be consumed in a Revit model. How did we do that? We've got a black box sitting behind the scenes that is looking for these configurations to be generated. When one drops in, we recognize it, we pick it up, we run it through Inventor to process it, to get our slab the way it needs to be, the right size, the right style, uh, the right material assigned, and then we run it through BIM Exchange to push it out to uh, Revit. Then we pick it up and we post-process it. What does post-processing mean in this case? We open it up in Revit, we take that component that we've dropped in from Inventor, we insert it into a door template so it gains the ability to, to behave like a door, as we said earlier, posted inside of a wall containing hinge side, flip side handles so you can swap these, the direction of swing, location of swing, that sort of thing. We post process it in Revit to get that behavior. Then we save it off and send that data on down the line to the architect to be able to pick it up, consume it, and bring it into their Revit model. What would that look like if we did it today? We built that solution just probably four years ago. Uh, what would it look like? How would it change if I were to do that today, now that we've got Forge and some of the other things out there? What I would do is I would embed that configurator directly in a web in a, a web control inside of a Revit form. So now I can make my selections from directly inside of Revit. I'm not going out to an external web page anymore. I'm making my selections, I'm capturing what I need, and I submit that up to Forge and it gets processed in real time. So I would leverage design automation to generate my new model. I would generate the base model from my inventor content. I would jump over to design automation for Revit to post-process it just like I did before to embed it inside of a door family. And then I would convert that resulting model back into a web viewable component that I could dis display inside that same Revit window to show them the results. Now I'm from Selection to receipt is seconds, and I can see it. And I can spin it around, make sure it's exactly what I want. If it's not exactly what I want, I can go through the process again. But once I've seen it, once I've flipped it around, looked at it in the Forge Viewer inside of Revit, now I can deliver it directly into my model. I can update the appropriate instances where I've got different doors and windows placed inside my model. It updates, and now I've got appropriate BIM data placed in my model with very, very little work from me. Now, a really cool one to kind of bring us, uh, bring us all the way back around to what a modern solution looks like. <clears throat> Industrial walkways. This particular customer needed to allow their customer base to configure their own walkway with appropriate behaviors and appropriate safety measures around that. So we can't let them build a walkway that can't be made. We can't let them have open sides where they could fall off. Can't have any of that kind of stuff. Um, to the user that's going to be doing this. We want to walk them through it. So we gave them a 2D quick layout solution to allow them to lay out the path, control what they, they are selecting, control where those components are, control what they're seeing for stairs and ladders and things of that nature. We also allow them to visualize that in 3D right there in their browser to make sure that we know what it is, we got exactly what we want, and then we generate an engineering documentation directly from that without remodeling. How did we do that? We created a simple interactive web configurator that allowed them to lay out those blocks that represent those uh, walkway components. We submitted that layout to design automation, generated an intelligent inventor model, converted that to a web viewable, and brought it right back to them immediately. So now they're seeing it, they're interacting with it directly in the browser. Now we know what we want, We've 
completed it. We've placed the order. Now my engineering department has it. I don't want to have to remodel that. So we don't, we take the results of that design automation process as a native inventor model. We open it up and we bring it into inventor to let our engineers take it from there and work with it as if they had modeled the entire thing from scratch. So let's take, take a couple minutes and see what that really looks like. I'm just going to let this play. So you, hopefully uh, this video is, is moving forward for you. I'm going to let this play and kind of see what this really looks like. We've talked about a few examples. We've had some pretty images and things like that of some of those. But let's talk about this in the real world. I go through. I lay out my components. I place my elements where I want them. I choose stairs, ladders, whatever it might be to be able to see it. And now I've got my model. I save it, submit it back. I'm back to my project interface. And now I'm going to open up that model in the Forge Viewer directly in that browser. Here comes my model. As you can see, just a few seconds. I'm able to interact with that model in real time in my Forge Viewer to be able to see that design that I just created. And now I can open it inside of Inventor. And I've got native Inventor models without any sort of retouch, without any sort of edit. Full bill of material capability. I can balloon it, bubble it, call it out, whatever I need to do, because it is truly native Inventor content at that point. So as you can see, really cool stuff happening uh, in modern engineering and design automation. We're able to do a lot of things that we couldn't even, even four or five years ago. Delivering content directly to customers in a browser in real time is very, very powerful. And it has huge impacts downstream as we continue to produce these uh, designs as we go forward. Thank you very much. That concludes my presentation for today. I think we're going to turn it over to uh, a little bit of question and answer.